So I know you're quite busy, so I'm going to uh, go straight in. <laughs> um, you know, in, um, in his latest book, Re Resurrecting Retail, The Future of Business in a Post-Pandemic World by Doug Stevens, he did a virtual launch on Facebook, uh, on in, uh, YouTube, where he talked with Christina Fontana, uh, the head of fashion and luxury at Alibaba. And she mentioned that in a store opening in China, uh, customers could actually scan their mobile phones and have QR codes on products so that they could learn more about the brand and have videos with celebrities and to drive brand engagement. I was wondering if the technology is there, this technology could actually be used to uh, give customers information about the product in terms of sustainability and production or the manufacturer or you know everything. So why do you think if this technology is there, why do you think brands aren't using it to actually uh, promote their sustainability credentials? Well, I think that's a really interesting point. And I think what we need to be thinking about here is not to become too obsessed with the te technology, because whilst that technology is a portal to information about um, the products that the consumer is buying, what that actually isn't dealing with for me, it's deflecting attention away from the volume of the product that is being produced so I, I would welcome any kind of intervention which allows the consumer to be more informed, um, to allow for greater transparency in terms of the work ethics behind the brand, um, certainly in terms of the constitution of the makeup of the fabrics and the garment as a whole. Um, but for me, the biggest issue is the volume, the quantity um, of products that brands are putting out. As for why aren't using this technology, I think we have to be very careful. Um, you know, we've heard a lot about the word greenwashing over the last couple of years, where brands are putting forward a particular position to the press, to the media, but in terms of their actual behaviours, um, they aren't necessarily aligning with that public statement. You know, they may have a sustainable agenda, a sustainable policy, but in terms of their actual activities, um, I think the technology is already ahead of their actual practices. So I, I think it's going to take some time for the two to align, really, because once we have that open door of total transparency, then brands need to have their house in order before, you know, consumers can engage with it and make meaningful decisions about brands. And that, that is an interesting point. I mean, in uh, Greta Thunberg's interview to Vogue Scandinavia, she famously said, you cannot mass produce fashion and consume sustainably. But, you know, with the greenwashing marketing strategies, some brands produce ethical lines and people assume that they are ethical brands when, when they're not. Where, where is the line? How can people trust or how can people know which brands to go for? It's about how we change people's perception of fashion in the broader sense. Um, and I think what we need to be thinking about in terms of choice is not necessarily choice around which particular brand to go for, but I will come back to that. But I think for me, in terms of my research, which is why I adopt a psychosocial approach, it has to be a change in behavioral patterns. So I think for me, in answer to your question, it's, it's a two-stage approach. I think we need to have greater work in the media, in the fashion press, to moving towards the curation of individual style over mass fashion. So this isn't, you know, in my research, it isn't about being anti-fashion, absolutely not. But I think we need to do a major reset, a major re-educate to recognize that there is a correlation between the damage being done to the planet and approach to fashion whereby we buy something one week and discard it the next. And I would like to see the fashion industry doing far more to work at the level of the consumer on curating individual style and how that style need not necessarily come from the first, the primary market, 
but in the secondary market as well. And I think in terms of the question that you raised, which brand should consumers go for, then I think as part of that educational um, exercise, if we can then identify those brands who are doing much more to slow down the pace of fast fashion, and for those brands who are taking time to recognize that there is more work to do around the life of a garment than simply sell it, um, I think that will have, you know, um, a great leap forward. So for me, one of the brands that I have a lot of time for, which is probably one of the pioneers in the sector, is Patagonia, um, both in terms of its, you know, its, its ethics, its recognition of the relationship of the garment to the broader society, and also, you know, in, in terms of its recognition that there is brand attachment to a garment. And once a consumer has that attachment the brand is actually functioning there to keep that attachment alive through repair, recycling, et cetera, et cetera. So in terms of your question about building relationships with brands, I think it needs to come from a broader educational shift in the media towards how we form relationships with brands, the transparency of the brand saying what they're doing for not just the sale of the garment, but the life of the garment, and then allowing consumers to develop a sense of style by holding on to garments longer. I mean, it's interesting that you, in one of your elements, you identify promotion, like quality over quantity. And that was actually during the promotion of uh, Green Carpet Fashion Awards 2020, there was a promotional video by Tom Ford where it actually asked everyone to question how they wear clothes and to really invest in clothes like for a lifetime. And absolutely. Uh, so, but, but, people are still kind of catching up because each time the Duchess of Cambridge wears the same dress or the same pair of shoes is still newsworthy. So that shows that it's still very much an exception to the rule and people are expected to wear different things all the time. I think we have to think back to where this comes from, this, this, this compulsion to wear different things all the time. Um, I think where my paper comes in and my argument is, is Fashion has always been aligned to time, has always been aligned to seasons. But I think what, what troubles me at the moment is the speed, the temporal change between which something comes into fashion and something goes out of fashion. And obviously that is what is causing the fundamental problems at the moment, the very, very short life of the garment and the compulsion to, um, you know, uh, discard that garment once one feels one has been seen in it. So that idea, you know, of the Duchess of Cambridge now, um, you know, being applauded for wearing items that have already been worn before, um, that is something that I think has to enter more into the lexicon of fashion. We shouldn't be constantly um, creating news stories based on somebody wearing something new, but rather we need to craft a language whereby we recognize somebody's style and about how they are using particular garments to, to cultivate that sense of style. Um, and so this, this, this idea of Tom Fords is something I adhere to very strongly. It's about quality over quantity. It's about thinking very, very carefully what you are buying, buying less and buying it of quality. But more than anything else, for me, it's about using the secondhand market um, because that quality exists in secondhand. And I think there's a massive job of work, which is what I'm trying to do through my research and teaching to amplify the values of the secondhand market, to realize you know, that it, there is some wonderful items out there that um, should be used uh, to cultivate that sense of style. And one shouldn't always be going to the first market, the primary market, in order to do so. Yes, I mean, we, we heard of the Generation Z that they use uh, Vinted and Depop to go into the secondhand sales. And in luxury fashion, we hear yeah. about all these successful business models uh, based on rental. Uh, but, but there's still a lot of work to do in, in this mm -hmm. sense. But re returning to your research, you identify consumers, brand, and government. Out of these three, do you think there's one that 
has more more weight than than the others no i think we have to work together i think that the issues and the problems that we are encountering now around carbon emissions you know 10% of annual carbon carbon emissions are made from the fashion industry and i think i think the three the brands the consumers and the government have to work together to tackle this uh, working isolated and individually is not going to produce a solution so i think you know and, and for advertising my background's in advertising i'm not anti promotion i've worked in advertising agencies but i think you know there is you know there's a good job of work to do levi's are doing some really good work around sustainability at the moment um and using some really strong figures you know in their advertising campaigns to get people to think about the life of a garment and their relationship with it um so i don't think this can work in isolation i don't think we can just speak to consumers i don't think we can just speak to brands and i think the government has a role to play and at the moment i think that it's it's not focusing enough on fashion the government is focusing too much on um you know air travel transport plastic which is fantastic but what i'm trying to do is bring fast fashion onto that agenda of things that the government needs to work with brands on in According to the new consumer mind, how and why we shop and buy by Kate Yero, she uh, actually asked people to ask themselves three questions: Do I really want it? Can I afford it? Does it fit into my lifestyle? Because what she discovered is that we tend to buy things uh, out of a whim or due to marketing strategies, or because we saw it in a celebrity or an influencer, and then we end up discarding things or have it on our wardrobe without even wearing it once. You know, we just did, what what can we do to actually educate consumers to really realize their responsibility uh, in tackling this issue? Because I think it's everyone's responsibility. It's not just brands. It's not just government uh, and for me personally i have i have a couple of friends who you know they they have good jobs they have high income but they will still go to fast fashion because they can get a scarf for 10 pounds uh, mm. you know so so most people even though they're kind of aware of what's happening they choose to be oblivious to it what can mm. be done to actually change this attitude I think that's a brilliant question and I think that gets to the heart of of what I'm interested in and I think where where this this uh problem sits really is in a in a broader culture of immediate gratification. We've reached a point now where fast fashion is almost positioned as a reward. Um you know, we're looking for uh something within material culture to make up for a sense of lack somewhere else in our lives so for me consumption shopping is very much tied to our emotions and somehow we feel there is a connection between mood and what we purchase and i think what we've got to think about is how we can tie those emotions to other activities outside of an immediate need to consume So for example, you know, I think one of the things that we're sadly lacking in society based on this this quest for immediate gratification are hobbies and pastimes. You know, there's been a lot of wonderful literature coming out of the pandemic of the need for mindfulness. So I would like to see more and more people instead of just reaching out and buying something new, turning towards craft, turning towards learning new skills, knitting, embroidery, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and making their own clothes um and that way you form a, a greater bond a greater relationship with you know with that item because you have made it but there is something fundamental in the psyche um whereby and i think advertising has a large part to play here whereby we feel that these objects are marketed to us uh, and that once we purchase them somehow our life will be complete but the speed at which fast fashion moves it's like even if we purchase that item and we feel satisfied already we feel it is out of date and need to move on to the next one and i think we've got to this is why it can't be one 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 group it can't just be government it can't just be brands it can't be consumers we've got to find a platform of working together to slow this pace down because in effect it's 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 a vicious circle 
in that we, we build these anxieties, we use social media, we think that there is something out there that we are lacking and consumption will provide us the answer with. But even when we purchase it, it's almost as though we're chasing our tail That because what we need now is X, not Y, A, not B. And so there is a constant you know, consumer anxiety in this quest for perfection, which isn't there. And that goes back to my point about this need to curate individual styles for us to feel comfortable with who we are rather than trying to copy the next big trend. And if we do that, if it's individual curation, the whole speed of the fashion industry will slow down. I mean, in the latest uh, Louis Vuitton uh, catwalk show in Paris Fashion Week, there was a member of the Extinction Rebellion who uh, came with a slogan uh, alerting against the dangers of overconsumption. And, you know, during the pandemic, there were some brands who kind of realized they were producing too many shows and kind of slowing down the pace. Um, and, you know, slowly, slowly, what seems to be happening is that we're getting back to what it was before as if as if nothing happened which is a real shame and and if we look for instance uh, at the catwalk show i mean nowadays we have it on our phones live stream yeah. across the world yeah. could it not be working as a product catalog where people would make products to order or order in advance uh, instead of having fashion buyers who are pressured to deliver sales results uh, in comparison to last year's sales. And it's all about profit uh, and really driving sales and producing new merchandising all the time. If people could order in advance, mm -hmm. just wait for the product, that would mean that no overproduction would be done. Yeah. Could we change completely the way the system works or do you think we're too further down the line to reverse the process? It's not going to happen overnight, um, but I think we have to make small steps to break that, that cycle. And, 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 and I talk a lot about time in my paper because time is critical to me between the wanting and the having. So going back to your example of the pre-order and the slowing down, I think it's a wonderful example because at the moment we're in a stage where I want it and have to have it. And I think that was one of the very negative elements of the pandemic for me was that where businesses were trying to compete um, was around um, you know, shortening that space of time between wanting and having, you know, order today, get it tomorrow. Someone else would say order today, get it tonight get it within two or three hours. And for me, you know, there is a real sort of psychosocial dimension here because once you want and then you have, then very quickly after that, the disappointment kicks in because already, you know, the garment has been built up in your mind, you have it, you try it on and it just doesn't live up to expectations. Whereas if we can build in, as your model suggests around viewing, pre-ordering, waiting, then you get anticipation. There's a greater degree of excitement in the garment arriving, which is a much, much slower temporal model that serves our psyche much better than the constant chase of want, have, want, have, want, have. Yes, I was thinking about the Birkin bag, for instance, or Michelin star restaurants where people willingly wait for it. So yeah. I think that would be great. And, and the other thing that we uh, and you touch upon is the circular fashion. So not only, uh, you know, resale and do you think that will grow more and more or could brands actually use unsold stock instead of putting them on outlets or uh, putting yeah. on these incineration facilities? Could they actually rework their unsold merchandise and, and make it into new products. Some brands are already doing that, but you know, it's still a very- Absolutely, Lena. Um, I am all for the circular economy. Um, you know, I think that the work that the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has done in drawing attention to it and, and recognizing that we have to use the garment across its full life. But I think from, you know, the lens of my research, it's become distorted as a model and somehow what's happened is that it is absorbing fast fashion to a point where the circle is slowing down and becoming sluggish. 
Because what's happened is that people are using the circular economy as a crutch in that they're buying things, realizing they no longer want them and giving them into, for example, the charity sector. And so what's happening, we haven't got a true circular economy. We've just got an economy that's at the, at the moment on the cusp of imploding with items that are going to charity, going to landfill, et cetera. So I think a brighter and fresher way to look at the circular economy is exactly as you say, where brands are actually taking ownership and responsibility for last season's collections and stopping and thinking, well, you know, does that mean the end of the garment or can that be repurposed? You know, might we have more and more discount outlets where, you know, you, you develop a passion for a brand, but the fact that it's last season's collection, we shouldn't keep talking in these temporal models of last season's collection or, you know, oh gosh, that was out two or three years ago. You know, items that are good quality can endure, you know, as Tom Ford said, you know, for, you know, uh, you know a commensurate period of time. So brands need to do more and keep in house and this will help their profit margins as well because one of the biggest arguments is oh well you know if you slow everything down brands won't make a profit well they will because if they are more imaginative in their thinking and develop different kinds of collections develop their own vintage collections etc and just keep in their own circular economy their collections season upon season then they will still have an appeal and what happens there is that the promotional industry still have a part to play because you're not just promoting this season's. If a brand can diversify and have these series of collections over time, then there is still promotional capacity in there. So I am not about, you know, talking of the end of fashion, the end of promotion and the end of advertising. I'm just asking for a, a group of, um, you know, uh, consumers and producers and promoters who at the moment are sitting, you know, in different spaces and occupying different spaces to come together and have a conversation about slowing fast fashion down to a way that can, you know, begin to address climate change. Because if we don't, you know, this, this whole concept of the circular economy, which is, you know, showing, you know, some seeds of promise is, is actually becoming overloaded with garments to the point where it is literally imploding.